Welcome to the Lou Catino Show, where we can learn to reimagine our lifestyle. Welcome to Reimagine Your Lifestyle. And today I'm so, so happy and privileged to have Dr. Gabor Mate, a Hungarian born Canadian physician, a renowned speaker, best selling author of several books who specializes in the study and treatment of addiction and is also widely recognized for his unique perspective on childhood development, trauma, addiction, potential lifelong impacts on the physical, mental health, including autoimmune diseases, cancer, ADD, ADHD, and other conditions. I had the privilege of having an entire evening and a dinner with Dr. Gabor last year in California with Deepak Chopra and a whole load of other brilliant, brilliant minds. And that's when we started talking about emotional health, the impact on disease and the physical self. And today we have this gentleman giving us time to enlighten us with all of his knowledge. Gabor, thank you so much for being on our show. It's a pleasure to see you again after seeing you in California early last year. And uh, the Indian audience loves you. And uh, I did put up a post a couple of months ago to ask, like, you know, if I'm talking to you, what kind of questions would they have for you? So I'll get straight into that. You know, in our field of working with cancer patients and disease, you know, there's still that non-belief that there is a connection of the mind, emotions, and the body. And in your book, you talk about cancer, diabetes, IBS, MS, and its connection with emotions. I would love for you to touch upon this topic so we can understand that there's way more than just medicine and nutrition and exercise. Sure. It's a little um, uh, strange for me to hear that in India, this is a problem because traditional Ayurvedic medicine always understood the unity of mind and body, as have traditional medicinal practices from China to, uh, to the indigenous cultures in Africa and, and, and North and South America. It's only Western modern science, or I should say medical mind, that separates the mind from the body. <clears throat> and even then, this is in the face of all kinds of scientific evidence. So I'll just give you a few examples. Um, in uh, something like 1870, a French neurologist who first described multiple sclerosis, Jean-Martin Charcot, his name was, said that this is a disease related to grief and stress. Now, since then, it's been shown, for example, that parents who lose a child, they have doubled the risk of uh, multiple sclerosis. Mm -hmm. There's all kinds of studies that show that parents who lose a child have higher risk of leukemias and blood cancer. There was a study out of Harvard a few years ago that showed that women with severe post-traumatic stress disorder have doubled the risk of ovarian cancer. There's all kinds of studies that show the relationship between early trauma, lifelong stress, and rheumatoid arthritis. All kinds of studies that show the relationship of childhood trauma, abuse, to irritable bowel syndrome, chronic fatigue, fibromyalgia, migraines, all kinds of autoimmune diseases. And not only are the correlations shown, the ph physiological pathways linking mind and body, the emotions, and our immunity have been perfectly well established. So what's frustrating for me, and I think for all of us in the health field who are aware of this, is the gap between medical science on the one hand, I should say physiological, biological, and medical science on the one hand, and medical practice on the other. So if it was only that modern medicine ignored the mind-body unity as taught by traditional practices for eons, that would be understandable. But when it ignores the scientific evidence, that's a little bit more hard to swallow, for me at least. You know, I think here's the evidence. So there's a tremendous resistance to looking at the actual evidence. And uh, I'll stop there. But all I'm saying is that it's not a question of insight or, or wisdom. It's a question of actual science. Yeah, no, I'm glad you bring that up because you are absolutely right. India is a country that has traditional medicine and we have different yeah. forms of it. But I think, I think the whole 
Western influence and the culture that's moved into our country. It's like we actually have people in the United States of America today that are eating Indian food, adopting yeah. yoga, understanding the subconscious mind. But back in our country, we're adopting more of the Western culture and separating the mind from the body. And that's exactly where the problem is. And I love that you bring out the science because even in your book, The Myth of Being Normal, you talk about low anger scores and yeah. the suppression of emotions. And we see that every day. If I had to put a percentage to it, 99.9% .9 of our breast cancer patients have suppressed emotions that they agree to, but they don't have the ability to express it because of joint families and various other re, you know, issues in our country. Uh, uh, Gabor, I would love for you to talk about you know, expressed emotions and over your years of practice, what are some of the easiest ways that people who you know, have these emotions, where can they start? Where could they start with the whole expression, sim simple techniques? I know you have the seven A's of healing as well. So I would love for you to talk about that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, so first of all, let me make a comment about India. You guys have been colonized. Your minds have been colonized. So it's not just that the British took over your country, appropriated resources, your resources, suppressed your people, actually suppressed your resistance until they could no longer do it. But they also took over your minds. And so this mind-body separation is a colonial mindset. And um, it's a question of, which dominates, of course, here in Canada as well. But what I'm saying is that we have to decolonize our minds. And decolonizing our minds being opening to the wisdom of the whole world, not thinking that the Western ways, now the Western ways, as you and I both know, have achieved amazing accomplishments. And Western medicine can do a lot of things that other medicines can't even dream about. So that needs to be acknowledged and valued, but it's very narrow. It is a colonial mindset that's dualistic, that separates mind from the body and emotions from our physiology. Now, if you look at anger that you just mentioned, what is the role of healthy anger? Now, it turns out that physiologically, our brains are wired for anger. We have a circuitry for anger. So do other mammals. Why? Because without that, we don't survive. Healthy anger just says, it's a boundary defense. It says, you're in my space, get out. That's healthy anger. We're wired for it. Just as we're wired for love and fear and uh, grief and curiosity, <clears throat> we're also wired for anger. Now, when you say, how do we get there? The more interesting question is, how do we lose it? Because we're born with it. Have you ever met a one-day-old baby that doesn't know how to get angry? Mm -hmm, true. Yeah. Try ignoring it. Mm -hmm. Or try feeding it something it doesn't want to eat. You know, you're going to find out what anger is all about. You know, so that, Because they're protecting their boundaries. Or they're asking for something they need. And they're frustrated that they're not getting it. So we're born with healthy anger. The question is, why does it get suppressed? Now, you're quite right about breast cancer. All kinds of studies have shown the relationship between repressed anger and breast cancer. And when I used to work in palliative care, looking after terminally ill people, I, uh, I saw this all the time. And I saw it in my family practice. And there's all kinds of research linking the repression of anger and uh, all kinds of cancers and autoimmune diseases as well. So the question is, what happens? What happens is, is that the child has a need to belong, to be accepted, to be loved, to be nurtured. The child also, and, and as I point out, you were kind enough to mention my book, The Myth of Normal. And um, as I point out in this book, um, the child has a need to belong, to be accepted, as I just said, but he, she, they also have a need to be able to experience their emotions and to be able to express them. That's a need of human beings for, for healthy development. But what, what happens in a family where a child gets the message that in order, to be, in order to be acceptable and to be looked after and to be loved, I have to suppress myself. So then comes what I call this tragic tension between authenticity, being ourselves, being able to express and experience our emotions, and attachment which is a need to belong and what gets sacrificed in every case if the child gets the message that there's no room for their actual emotions 
at age two, three, four, five, they'll suppress those emotions for the sake of belonging, for the sake of being accepted. And that becomes a lifelong pattern. And in India, well, all over the world, by the way, this strikes women more than it strikes men in general, which is in, why, in my opinion, women have the preponderance of autoimmune diseases, and they have more non-smoking related cancers. And if a woman does smoke, her risk of developing cancer is double that of a man. Because I think women are programmed into suppressing themselves to serve other people's needs. But this is particularly true in countries like India, where there's a, not, not that I'm an expert by any means on in Indian culture, but from having many Indian patients and, and having looked at it from the outside, there are many beautiful values about Indian culture, like the community and the extended family and the sense of belonging. I mean, it's amazing when you look at it. So you have an Indian wedding, there's like 10,000 people there, you know, I'm, I'm exaggerating, but you know, there's a whole community that comes together, you know, to celebrate and to grieve. And that's good. But there's also a hierarchy. And in that hierarchy, women are considered or and forced to be having less power than men and younger women are subjected to their mother-in-laws until they become mother-in-laws when they start suppressing the younger women in, in their orbit mm -hmm. and so that it's bad enough here in north america you know the power hierarchy and the enforced suppression of one's authenticity. But in a culture where this is communally enforced, it's very hard for women to express themselves without feeling a threat to their very sense of belonging. And let me tell you an interesting study. <clears throat> this was done in um, the United States. They looked at 2000 women over a 10 year period. And over that 10 year period, those women that were unhappily married and didn't express their feelings were four times as likely to die as those women who were unhappily married and did express their emotions. So when you ask how do we go back to it? Well, I think the answer is threefold. One is ask yourself what it's costing you to suppress yourself. Mm -hmm. Ask yourself, as a child, I had no choice. I had to give up my authenticity in order to attach, in order to belong. Do I still have to do that? Number three, what support can I get? Can I afford to talk to a therapist or, or talk to a friend or somebody? You know? Or at least can I keep a diary where at least in writing I express my emotions? So you got to start somewhere. But in other words, we have to get back to that baby state where we're in touch with our gut feelings and we were not not afraid to express them well, thank, thanks for touching upon that you're absolutely right about the culture in india and the values there's the beautiful part of it and then there's the part of it where children are not allowed to you know speak to this to the extent that a lot of our patients are cancer patients a lot of women have been sexually abused when they were four or five years old and told by their own parents you can never speak to anyone. This is one of the most common cases. And so they were like, we could deal with the fact, okay, it was not in our parents' control. We got raped by an uncle or someone else. But the fact that our parents told us that we can never tell anyone is what they grapple at at age 60 and 65, and they're suffering from disease. So it is a part of our culture where there is a power that, you know, if I'm providing for the family, you have no right. You like your role is the kitchen or it is changing. It is changing. But for the generation that has gone through it, the statistics match exactly what you say. We see this in arthritis. We see it in cancers. We see it in MS and all of that. No, but those tips are great. I think journaling is a great start. It's something simple that people can, you know, immediately start because some parts of therapy in our country is still a kind of, you know, the elders wouldn't allow them to go. Husbands wouldn't allow their wives to go for therapy because it makes it look bad on that particular family. So I, I guess we're breaking. Well, you know, so, so, so again, it's yeah. the victim that is supposed to be ashamed of what happened mm. rather than the perpetrator, you know, mm. 
And every once in a while, I read news reports from India, like even now, of especially on a caste basis, when somebody gets raped or assaulted, they're the ones who are supposed to be ashamed of themselves rather than the perpetrators. Now, it's very interesting. Um, I run a program called Compassionate Inquiry, which is a therapeutic method that I've developed along with others. And we've had programs for India. And so we've had four or 500 people from India online working with us. And the commonest dynamic is exactly what you just described. That women tell us that they were sexually assaulted and they weren't allowed to talk about it. And they were made to feel bad about it. And even now, they can't um, find the latitude to speak about it without facing disapproval. You know, so that's something that I know a lot of good people in India are trying to reverse, um, a lot of brave people, but it's even here, you know, it, 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 it's very much of a challenge. And even here, here in the courts, it's very difficult for people to find justice. Right. Can you tell me a little bit about that program? You said you've already had a, a lot of people from India. Is this an online program that you run very often so our audience can hear about this and probably register for it? Well, the program is called Compassionate Inquiry. And um, <clears throat> the basic assumption or the conviction that we have is that the truth is inside everybody. Mm -hmm. If they're granted a compassionate listening, and if the right questions are asked, the right inquiry is conducted, then the truth will emerge. And um, so this is something that we train doctors and therapists and counselors and body workers and health professionals. We've had over 3,500 students in 80 countries now. It's a very demanding year long program. It's not for the faint hearted. And we do offer scholarships for those who need them as well. It's also a program that um, we sometimes run online. So um, I think the best way that, so we've had, for example, Compassion Inquiry online programs for India. Mm -hmm. We did that once or twice. Yeah. And we, we charge less money than we would in the West. And uh, as I say, we've had hundreds of people sign up every time. I think the best way to um, uh, find out about these programs is to look at the Compassion Inquiry website. Uh, you can find it or to sign up, go to my website and sign up for the mailing list and you get notices about it. So it's offered both as a training for professionals, but also as a support program for, uh, just this last Saturday, two days ago, we had um, um, an online introduction. We had about a thousand people from all over the world um, for the program. So you, you can find it. Yeah, we find that. Thanks for sharing that for our audience as well. Uh, yeah. Gabor, you talk about cancer personality. Yeah. Can you talk a little bit about that, please. I've read about it, but I'd love for you to explain it to our audience. Yeah. So <clears throat> just a correction. Although they talk about the cancer personality, that's not quite accurate. Mm -hmm. um, what there are is certain traits that emotional and behavioral traits that make cancer more likely. But they're not fixed traits, they're reversible. Okay. Nobody was born with them. It's what you call our second nature. And that word or that phrase, second nature, is very interesting, isn't it? Because it implies there's a first nature. Mm -hmm. And that's what I was talking about, is that we're born with a first nature that's expressive and connected to ourselves. The suppression is a second nature. So these are traits but they're not fixed with awareness and, and help. They, they're reversible. But when I was in family practice, I began to notice that, and, you know, I had an advantage over you specialists because I saw people before they got sick. So I got to know them before they had illness. When a specialist sees a person, they're already coming with a disease. But you have no idea what they were like before they got ill. You know, uh, whereas as a family physician, if your eyes are open, you, you get to see. And I began to notice that the people who got ill with cancer or chronic autoimmune disease or anything else, they have certain traits. 
nobody had taught me about this in medical school. So I just had to notice it for myself. What's interesting, though, is at the same time, other people were doing research on the very things that I was noticing. So the phrase cancer personality or cancer phase doesn't come from me. It came from a, a clinical uh, psychologist who was working at one of the American universities as the head of their medical psychology program. Lydia Temeshuk, her name was. And she noticed exactly what I noticed. So, what are the traits? An automatic and compulsive concern with the emotional needs of others while ignoring your own. That's the first trait of what we can call the disease-prone personality. Um, secondly, a compulsive, rigid identification with duty, role, and responsibility rather than the authentic self. So you're more concerned about your role in the world than who you are and what other people think of you than your own experience. The third one we've already talked about, it's the repression of healthy anger. Now, let me come back to anger for a moment because as I said, anger is a boundary defense. His job is to keep out what is toxic and dangerous to you. I'm talking about healthy anger. There's unhealthy anger, but I'm talking about healthy anger. You just know. Now, emotions in general, including anger, are like a boundary, boundary defense. A healthy boundary will let in what is healthy and nurturing and supportive and nutritive and keep out what is toxic and dangerous. And that's the role of our emotions. So we invite in what is supportive and loving and welcome. And we keep out what is unhealthy and dangerous. Now, I'm going to ask you, so that's the job of the emotions. I'm going to ask you a trick question. What's the role of the immune system? Yeah, to keep out, to fight viruses, germs, pathogens. At the same time, know when to switch on and off inflammation. Yeah, and all, but also to let in what is healthy, right? And what's healthy, absolutely, yeah. In other words, the emotional system and the immune system have exactly the same role. Now, not only do they have exactly the same role, they're the same system. Mm -hmm. Because scientifically, they're not separable. There's all kinds of ways in which they're wired together. So naturally, when you repress your healthy emotions, you're also disturbing the immune system. It's that simple, physiologically. So that's the third trait, repression of healthy anger. The fourth trait, I would say, of the disease, therefore cancer-prone personality, are two fatal beliefs. One of them is that you're responsible for other people feel. And the other is you must never disappoint anybody. So um, let's say you contact me because you're asking me to come on your podcast, mm -hmm. you know? And uh, that's a great invitation. But I'm tired, I'm too busy, I'm stressed, I, whatever, maybe I'm not feeling well. And I say, no, I'm sorry. Now, I'm not responsible that, you, that you're hurt or disappointed. And uh, it's not my job to worry about not disappointing you. You know, that if you're, no, you might be disappointed, but that's not my problem. Yeah. My problem is... I got to look after myself. And if I come on your program, and if I'm tired, stressed, and overworked, I'm just going to exhaust myself even more. So I can't put your emotions ahead of my own well being. And so, this belief that I'm responsible for how you feel and I must never disappoint you, that's fatal. And I say fatal, I mean it. Because when you live your whole life like that, you're taking on so many burdens and you're stressing yourself. And that stress, undermines your health. And by the way, you will never meet anybody with autoimmune disease and most cancers that don't have those characteristics. I agree with you. Our autoimmune patients have almost everything that you speak about. Everything, especially the last two. Especially yeah. the last two. But why does that happen? Why, don't, why do we find it so difficult to operate from our higher selves and our authentic selves? Is it related to childhood or is it related to social media, comparison, society? All that. Um, I already talked about the uh, childhood. What happens in childhood is that 
if you can be authentic and still be accepted and loved and valued that's great then you don't have to give up anything mm -hmm. but if you grew up in a family for example you mentioned sexual abuse now i'll tell you something surprising the real problem is not only the sexual abuse it's what happens when you ask people were you ever abused sexually as a child and they say yes then you ask them another question who did you how long did it go on for or oh, went on for two years or three months or whatever and you ask them who did you speak to about it you know what most of them will say nobody in other words by the time it happened that child felt so isolated from their families and so unsafe with their parents that they had to bury it inside themselves. Mm -hmm. Number one. Number two, if they do talk to somebody, generally they're not believed, or if they're believed, they're told to shut up about it. Yeah. So there's an enforced suppression. And when you think of the pain and the grief and the rage and the fear, that that child experiences, that they have to bury inside themselves. No wonder the immune system gets confused and there's so much evidence linking childhood abuse and adult mental health problems and physical health problems. So Gabor, you also talk about loneliness. Can you talk yeah. about of loneliness with disease because a lot of people still confuse being alone with loneliness and we see a direct correlation between certain demographics not just in india but even the united states where we have patients yeah. don't have family with disease alzheimer's and i would love for you to touch upon that and ways that we can you know overcome this because at the end of the day we want to fix the problem as well so yeah, yeah. so you're quite right to point to the distinction between being alone and being lonely. I can be alone and really enjoy myself and be perfectly happy. Mm -hmm. And I can be lonely in a crowd. And the distinction is not the number of people around you, but how connected you are to the people around you and how connected you are to yourself. Now, first of all, we get disconnected from ourselves in childhood because in the situation I just described, say the child is abused, those emotions of pain, fear, grief, and rage, and shame, are so disturbing that disconnecting from my body and even from my emotions is a protective mechanism. It's an adaption, adaptation. Now I'm separated from myself. I've lost the connection to myself. And I've lost the connection to others. Now, if you look at the world with globalization, with globalized capitalism, there's been an increase in an epidemic of loneliness. In Britain, they had to appoint a minister for loneliness, if you can believe it. In the United States, um, there was a study, I think, 10 years ago or so, in 20 years, the number of people who felt lonely doubled. Mm -hmm. Just in a decade or two. And loneliness has been shown to be as much a risk factor for ill health as smoking 15 cigarettes a day. And the American Surgeon General, who's got Indian, Indian background, Vivek Murthy, uh, he just issued a report on loneliness. And he says that the answer is connection. Well, that's true. The answer is connection. But we also have to look at what are the social factors that are responsible for that epidemic. So that loneliness is actually, I would define it as a sense of emotional isolation and a sense of loss. So you can be alone and not lonely. And you can be in a crowd and be totally lonely as well. Wow. I love the word that you use, connection, and how you talk about being connected to ourselves. So when we're on social media and the way the world is moving, we're connected outwards. So the more we're connected outwards, the less the connection with ourselves. Gabor, how do you handle the social media crisis that's kind of, you know, 
hitting parents. I remember when I was in New York just before I flew to California to meet you and the rest, right. you know, uh, I was addressing the YPO and they were a really fit chapter. They had no questions on nutrition. They had no questions on exercise. It was all about social media addiction and sleep problems and kids as young as eight years old on melatonin and stuff like that. So, so when you see the world through your experience, because you have that whole global outlook, you know, I mean, you know, what comes to your mind? Like what are those top one or two or three things that, you know, people can do, parents can do, governments can do, you know, what comes to your mind? Yeah. Well, first of all, it's called social media, but we should also call it a social media, anti-social media, because it actually causes more divisions than connections. That's yeah. the first. One. It isolates people in a room with the screen. Mm. Yeah. Now, like every other technology, it can be used well or can be used in harmful ways. When you give it to immature creatures, like young kids, guess what? They're going to use it in immature ways. And um, we know, for example, and never mind eight years, we see in restaurants here, we see kids one or two years old with their iPads or their cell phones. Now, these gadgets are deliberately designed. This is not a conspiracy theory. This is... Uh, conspiracy reality they're designed specifically to be addictive mm -hmm. so that it's called um what's it called neural marketing they're market they're appealing to the addictive parts of the nervous system of young kids so when you do brain scans on young kids who've been on social media who've been on screens a lot you can see that circuitry is damaged that regulates capacity for insight and cognitive thought and, and, and creativity and so on. These kids are literally brain damaged by social media. So um, there's another book that I helped to write. It's called Hold On To Your Kids, Why Parents Need To Matter More Than Peers. And it's the work of a brilliant psychologist friend of mine. I just did the writing with him. And here's what he points out that children have a need to belong, to connect, to attach. We talked about that earlier. But there's nothing in their brains that tells them who to attach to, who to connect to. That's the job of the culture. So just like a duckling hatching from the egg, when he, she sees the mother duck, will immediately imprint on the mother duck and follow the mother duck around. So the mother duck can actually be the mentor and the teacher and the guide. In the same way, human, human infants are, are meant to connect to their parents and to the elders. Now, how we evolved as human beings, as you know, for millions of years, we lived out in nature in small groups until about 15,000 years ago. That's how we evolved. Kids were always around the adults. And in most societies until recently, that was still the case. What's happening today? It's from an early age on, kids spend more time with each other than with adults. Now, guess what? That connection, that instinctual connection, now is transferred from the adults to other kids. Now they start following each other. They want to look like each other, talk like each other, behave like each other, think like each other, wear the same shoes, listen to the same music. The parents have lost their influence. Now the parents think there's something wrong. They punish the kid. There's nothing wrong. The kid is just following their attachment instincts. And then we give them these things, which means that even when kids are not in each other's physical company, they can be with each other almost 24 seven. And they're desperate to connect to each other because that's where looking for the, to have the emotional needs met and the sense of belonging and connection. It's a disaster. So if I was raising kids today and, uh, and we just there's a new edition of that book coming out hold on to your kids if i was raising kids today i would not let them near a screen until they're considerably grown and until i felt sure that they had enough respect for me and i had enough mm, 
benign influence over them that I could limit their use of those machines. It's an utter disaster. And it increases loneliness. If you look at the studies, kids are on these machines, they're more depressed. Um, not to mention all the bullying and stuff that parents don't even know about. So almost for the first time in history, you have a parallel culture where kids are in a world that the parents have virtually no influence over. And that's terrible. I think you beautifully answered the next question was, you know, parents keep complaining that, hey, my kids are not attached to me anymore. And you talk about reattachment in your book, Hold On To Your Kids. You talk about that, how to reattach to your kids. But you so beautifully explained, we've broken the connection. With the kids, yeah. they're obviously connecting. And we've never seen it that way, that kids are actually supposed to be more with parents to learn, the more mature one. But if they are with children, that's exactly what they're going to be learning. Which, uh, yeah, so if now parents realize that we've made this mistake, you know, how do we reattach to children or maybe even teenagers? It's really hard. It's really hard, um, but it can be done. Um, <clears throat> first of all, you mustn't take the child's behavior personally or see it as bad behavior. They just follow on their instincts. Their instinct is to be the ones that they're attaching to. It's not their fault that they've lost the attachment with you. It's not your fault either. That's really a function of the culture that we're living in. Mm -hmm. Don't take it personally. Um, whatever hurt emotions you have, don't make them about the kid. Number one. Number two. Have faith in something. Have faith in the reality that you're still their best bet. Because you can give them something that their peers can't, which is unconditional loving acceptance. And they need that. I mean, we all need it. But especially adolescents and young kids need it. Number three, you have to be very patient. It's not going to happen overnight. But you have to make yourself available. Um, you have to warm up the relationship, spend as much time with them as you possibly can, as they will allow you to. Mm -hmm. Don't force it, because if you force it, you're just going to get resistance. And you have to hang in, hang in there for the long term. Now, simple thing. In North America, the family meal is almost an endangered species. In India, the, the families still sit down to have a meal together. Well, yeah. maintain that. That's holy. And at the family meal, people shouldn't be watching TV together or everybody on their cell phones. Meals are not just about food. It's about connection and community. Um, yeah, there's lots of beautiful traditions in India, religious ceremonies and... and uh, cultural events and so on and you know use those but it's brilliant it's just you know during lockdown we had this one family that reached out and they had a three-year-old boy who was already put on to a, the broad, broad spectrum autism okay and the parents were like you know he's already been graded and all of that's happening and they came to us to see if there could be anything done with his nutrition and while we were going through the questions, he had 12 and a half hours of iPad time. The kid, three years old, 12 and a half hours. He was not even connecting with his parents anymore. They, he was emotionally distant. So, so what we did is we said, okay, fine. I mean, you go to medical bay, whatever you want to do. But for a week, can you like really just stop the iPad completely? He threw the most aggressive tantrums for the first two days. By day seven, he had yeah. reconnected socially automatically and he was not in the spectrum and i believe it's something called virtual autism right now that's you know giving you the symptoms of broad spectrum but it's really just the ipad time and it ties in beautifully with what you're saying about connection the virtual world and actual human beings well you know what the reason i was looking down is flipping my book is because in this book the myth of normal i quote uh, a fellow physician whose name is shimmy kang and she's actually from east indian background and she's done, she's written a book about this. And so let me, let me quote what she says here. Okay. I'm just going to find the right page in my book to quote her. And it's exactly what you just said. Um, she says, um, so Shimmy Kang, and she's a Harvard trained uh, 
psychiatrist in adolescence, you know, uh, specialist in adolescent addiction. And she wrote a book called The Tech Solution, Creating Healthy Habits for Kids Growing Up in a Digital World. That's her most recent book. And she says, right now we have mothers who are on their phones while they're nursing or giving an infant a phone during a diaper change. She says, the diaper change used to be this whole dynamic experience between the caregiver and the infant. You'd have to find a way to get them to sit still, and now you just give the child a phone and they lie quietly. And she says, um, this video is so attractive to the brain. And it's like, and she's the one that told me about this neural marketing. It's called persuasive design. Now, then I spoke to another expert uh, um, uh, who also has written a book. It's called I Minds. I Minds, how and why constant connectivity is rewiring our brains. And she says, we're seeing autistic-like characteristics in children without autism, she said. Lack of a smile response, delayed verbal skills. Now these are just the kids that are kind of running around aimlessly or commercially zombified when they're not on the tech. And it's exactly what you said. I used to work with drug addicts, as you know. And when you when a drug addict, you deprive them of their drug, they get enraged, they show tantrums. That's what these kids will do. And you have yeah. to endure it because that they're addicted and they're going through withdrawal. Literally, their brains are going through withdrawal. Wow. Well, thanks for sharing that, Gabor. I want to talk about love and relationships. Just, you know, a yeah. very general question from your experience, your years of experience looking at couples, marriages, whatever, relationships between people. You know, what's going wrong? Why is it becoming more and more difficult? I mean, I broadly know the answer, but from your experience, like what's going wrong at a macro level? And what are some of the things that we can start doing to kind of you know, really run our relationships from our authentic selves. I think that solves the problem, but I would love to hear your experience on this. Well, that's a very deep and complex question <clears throat> because um, there are some positive reasons why the relationships are more difficult now and there's some negative ones. Um, <clears throat> the positive reasons are um, like we talked about women and how they tend to suppress themselves more. And as a result, they have more autoimmune disease and cancer and this kind of thing. But some women are waking up. So my wife said to me, not that long ago, she said, uh, buddy, you've written a book called When the Body Says No. No, you better write one called When the Wife Says No. Because <laughs> <laughs> there's certain ways I was being workaholic and kind of narcissistic, that was hard on her. So as women assert their rights more and their needs more, men are going to be upset. It's not easy. All of a sudden, our traditional roles as being the dominant ones is being challenged, and we don't give that up so easily. That's a, I would say that's a positive reason, because if men can learn to adjust to that, it creates a whole new level of relationship which is much more open and intimate and, 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 and loving and, and, and equal. Mm -hmm. The negative reasons are, is that more and more kids are brought up in stressed homes and those stresses are absorbed early in childhood or those traumas and you bring them into the relationship. So often between my wife and I, when we had problems and we've had plenty of them it was like her stresses and traumas were battling with my stresses and traumas it's like there were four people there there was me and her there were then there was my stresses and traumas and hers and those would be the ones battling each other and the real people whose intention is to love and to connect weren't even present mm -hmm. that takes a lot of work at least for us, it's taken a lot of work. Uh, it all depends on how much stress and trauma you bring into the relationship. Now, the relationship can be a room, uh, a ground for growth and mutual, how should I say, maturation. 
and comfort and support so that we needn't be discouraged by the fact that we bring trauma and stress into the relationship but we have to be able to open to look at it and those marriages and i see this all the time when one couple when one member of the couple is open to growth and self-exploration and the other isn't now you have now you have problems and i see this all the time yeah i agree with you we have some couples who like you know when they were dating they smoked and they went out to clubs and then after three years one partner wants to change and doesn't want yeah. to do that anymore and now there's a rift and the gap grows longer because the other partner doesn't want to change and says that i don't want to change and the gap just yeah. grows more and more but Gabor, I want to ask you, I want to throw in another question with this about affairs. When a man or a woman has an affair, is this trauma related or sometimes it could just be greed? It could be, there are so many reasons, but from your experience, could there be trauma involved in this or, you know, anything else that you see just over and above greed or because it's easily available and society is so connected the wrong way, but what's your take on that? Partly it's cultural. Um, I'm just reading a book by an Egyptian author called Naguib Mahfouz. It's called the Cairo Trilogy. It won a Nobel Prize some decades ago. And it opens in, in, in Egypt at the time of the British protectorate, so-called. The British have such good terms for how they suppress people. They call it a protectorate. Who are they protecting from whom? Mm -hmm. They're protecting their own interests from the local population. That's what they were protecting you know <laughs> anyway in this book there's a family and the man is just free to have affairs that's just accepted as part of the culture it's his right so partly it's dominance i just get to do what i want to do and it is greed i mean the hindu or the buddhist sense of craving mm -hmm. yeah. That's one side. No, another two is because we bring our stresses and our traumas into a relationship. In the beginning, the relationship is very exciting and it's full of you know being in love and everything. You're walking on diamond roads and looking at starlit skies and where the sun is always shining on you, but that doesn't last. And then the realities of the relationship take over. Now becomes less exciting, less romantic, less passionate. And you think that the problem is in the marriage. So then you have to find it somewhere else. Mm -hmm. And you don't realize that you created the conditions where the passion got lost. So that, um, you know, I can talk personally, you know, many years ago, I left my wife. I thought, no, this is just, I can't find my true joy here. Fortunately, shortly afterwards, I realized that nothing wrong with my wife. The problem was that the way I was created a distance between us. And then I thought I'm missing something, but I created what I was missing mm -hmm. rather than deepening the relationship. Thirdly, in a strange sense, um, an affair is kind of a way of keeping the marriage going because partner a rather than saying to partner b i'm leaving you i'm not happy they're basically saying i want to stay in this relationship but i also want to have some fun but you know otherwise i would just leave you now i don't know do i recommend it i'm telling you it depends who you listen to i'm i'm not bringing expertise to this there's nothing that authorizes me to speak authoritatively I'll just say what I believe. I actually think that when you have an affair, it's exciting, it's passionate, it lights up the sky temporarily, and you're sacrificing a real part of yourself. And you're sacrificing a real potential with your actual partners, with your actual partner. And you're going for the external and the glitter rather than what's internally important. 
and I think you're hurting your partner, no matter what you tell yourself, you're distancing yourself. Because I don't know if you've ever lied to anybody, but I have. And what does that lying do to you? It distances you from yourself and it distances you from the other partner. So I think affairs, I'm not here to lay down a law, but I think on the whole, they are, they threaten what could be beautiful and very intimate. That's what I believe. Well, thanks for your honesty. That was beautiful. I really appreciate your honesty on that. Thank you, Gabor. I'll ask you one last question. You know, yeah. time is never enough for this. You talk about the relation between trauma and addiction. There is a yeah. huge amount of addiction in our country. I'm sure around the world as well right now. And it's going lower and lower, like 12 years, 13 years and above. There's a pattern. It doesn't matter what drug it is. It doesn't matter whether it's alcohol, but there's a pattern. And I would love for you to talk about you know, the correlation. So anyone watching this who is addicted, they can start to look at things beyond just, you know, society telling them what's right and what's wrong. Well, anybody who wants to know my views in depth on addiction, I would just recommend they just Google my name and, and put an addiction next to it on YouTube. I have probably a dozen talks on addiction on YouTube in great depth. But in brief, Allow me to give you a definition of addiction that I don't think is controversial. So an addiction I define as <clears throat> being manifested in any behavior in which a person finds temporary relief, pleasure, and therefore craves, but then suffers negative consequences and cannot give up despite the negative consequences. So craving pleasure, relief in the short term, harm in the long term, difficulty giving it up. That's when an addiction is. Now, notice I said nothing about drugs. It could be alcohol, it could be cocaine, it could be crystal meth, it could be opium, heroin, man-made drugs, um, obviously nicotine, caffeine. It could also be sex, gambling, shopping, eating, bulimia, pornography, internet, cell phones like we already talked about. So it could be a whole range, work even, I know that one. So I don't know. Let me ask you a question. I'm not going to ask you, by the way, what or any details, but according to that definition, have you ever had an addictive pattern in your own life? Yeah. Okay. I'm not going to ask you what it was or what to. Okay? I don't care. Mm -hmm. Let me ask you this. Not what was wrong with it. What was right about it? What did it give you in the short term? Yeah, temporary pleasure. Pleasure. Okay. Yeah. Oh, is pleasure a bad thing or a good thing? I think it's a good thing if it's not going to cause harm. Yeah, but in itself is not a bad thing, right? Not a bad thing. Yeah. Okay. In other words, the addiction wasn't your primary problem. Your primary problem was the lack of pleasure in your life. And um, the addiction was your attempt to solve the problem. Now, here's what I have to ask you. Not that I'm not asking for an answer. This is a rhetorical question. It's so common. Why on God's green earth, with all that's available to us, both in terms of natural resources and beauty and all the creation and all that human beings have been able to devise, why on earth do we find it so difficult to experience pleasure? Because we got disconnected from ourselves. You'll never meet a one-day-old baby who doesn't know how to experience pleasure. You know? So something happened to you that disconnected you from yourself. And that's where some degree of trauma comes into it. So what I'm saying about addiction, you know, if you talk to other people about addiction, it soothed my pain, it numbed me, it made me feel more powerful, it made me feel more connected, it eased my stresses. All these things are good things in themselves. <clears throat> the problem is, so that the addiction wasn't the primary problem. It wasn't contrary to what, so many doctors think it's not this disease that you inherited. It was the problem. You're trying to solve a problem, the problem of suffering. So, so the problem of emotional pain. So my mantra is, if I can put it that way, is don't ask why the addiction, ask why the pain. The addiction is just an attempt to solve a problem. So when I deal with addicted people, I say, not what's wrong with you, but what happened to you? What happened to you that you suffered so much that you had to escape into addiction to ease that suffering. 
which is a whole different approach. That doesn't make the addiction right. But it's not a question of right or wrong. It's a question of why did it come along? And why, what happened to you that you needed it or you thought you needed it, felt you needed it? That's, those are the real questions. So it's not just a question of the behavior. The behavior is only a symptom of an underlying wound that needs to be healed. That's my nutshell response to depression about addiction. So that's the connection with trauma. Yeah, that's the connection with trauma. Sick. No, no, we will have uh, your YouTube channel put in the show notes as well. Doctor, before I let you go, I'm mindful of your time. We have a minute left. If you had the whole world listening to you right now, with all of your years of experience, the, the number of books you've written, you know, what would your advice be? Just to, to, you're speaking to the general public, to people, based on what you would prioritize as human life. What would your basic, you know, what would your general advice be to people before we leave? Yeah. That's a nice little trick you just pulled. You said that you got one minute and then you give me this. No, no, no. You can take more than that. I'm happy. <laughs> I can do this in 10 minutes, 20 minutes. I'm happy. Yeah. No, you don't have a time. Yeah. I'm, just pulling your, I'm just pulling your leg here. Um, well, there's a story about the Buddha that he's walking along the road, and it's a very famous story, and some stranger coming the other way looks at him, and the Buddha looks radiant and present and just all there. And uh, the stranger says, what are you, a god? And the uh, Buddha says, no, I'm awake. You know, so, you know, culture and life and trauma, there's so many ways that we can go to sleep. And we don't really see what's going on with us. We pursue wrong values that can't possibly do us any good. Um, we disconnect from ourselves because we had to because it was too painful to stay connected. So if I had one message, just wake up, you know, just wake up. Um, really, don't be afraid to look at what doesn't work in your life, but be curious about it. Instead of seeing problems as just nuisances to get rid of, explore them, see where they came from, see what the roots are inside yourself, and see what you can, see if you can wake up to your real self. That's, those are fancy words, but that's uh, at least they're easy to say. Uh, I can personally tell you they're not that easy to realize in practice, but that's my best advice. That's beautiful. Beautiful, Gabor. Thank you so much. Before we end, I need to tell you that your book, The Myth of Normal, you know, I'm proud to say I have two of your signature copies that you handed over to me. And please uh, thank your wife for the beautiful painting that she sent for my daughter of the two little cats. Oh. But that oh. book has changed many of our patients' lives. We recommend it when we identify low anger scores. And you won't believe we have messages from them of how certain chapters of the books have just, like I can say, they they awoke reading certain chapters. They just, you know, it awoke so many different sensations and messages in them. So thank you for that. And Gabor, thank you for your time. I know how busy you are. It's great seeing you again. Thank you for all of the value you've added to our lives in the last one hour. I truly appreciate it. Well, thank you so much. If I may quickly say, um, that book has been published in nearly 40 countries now, but not in India. And none of my books have ever been published in India. And yeah. I, I know they're known there, but they haven't been published there. So um, you have a great fan following in India. And we yeah, have so, yeah. lots of people who have your book already. They oh, that's good. Books, yeah, anyway, listen. I, I really appreciate your invitation. I, I, I really uh, am grateful for the opportunity to address your audience. Thank you for having me. Yeah, thank you so much. Take care, Gabriel. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Stay tuned for more. We're going to continue our journey learning, sharing, and evolving.